is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Now, stocks broadly higher, treasuries mixed before today's expected, of course, well, uh, dis deceleration in U.S. inflation. Now, the world's biggest chip maker, TSMC, beats estimates, concerns linger over mounting economic headwinds and tighter U.S. trade controls. Plus, a less than stellar U.K. picture, earnings out this morning indicate retailers are concerned economic headwinds will continue to bite. So first thing is first, let's check in on the market. Stocks in Europe uh, are actually gaining. It's all about the U.S. inflation report a little bit later on. Of course, traders are now starting to wager uh, some bets that U.S. inflation is cooling, therefore reducing, of course, the pressure for the Fed to hike aggressively. Now, I'm also looking at some of these European stocks because we had a lot of earnings. So we look at retail here in the U.K., uh, higher today in terms of sectors. We have mining and energy. There's also optimism about demand coming from China. European stocks gaining five tenths of eight percent. S&P futures pretty much flat, and then sterling 121.37. Join us, of course, for our UK special in half an hour. Now, this is the big story. Maybe let's look at the European map very quickly, but there's not that much of a difference between, for example, Germany gaining some five-tenths of 8% and the CAC 40. Now, U.S. inflation data due later today will probably bolster the case for the Fed to keep moderating its tightening pace. Here to discuss all of this, Andrew Balls, Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income at PIMCO. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Um, you have a great report out outlining some of the pitfalls for the next 12 months. How much volatility are you expecting? Well, we should see lower fixed income um, volatility compared with um, last year. There's a lot of uncertainty in the in the outlook, of course, but the the uncertainty over the course for the Fed or for for the other global central banks is is a lot lower, um, I think, than the experience of, of the last year. And and, and across um, fixed income markets, um, uh, we expect somewhat lower volatility this year. For equities, I mean, you have the um, the uncertainty over the extent of the recession. Um, you know, our forecast is for um, mild recession across countries, but you want to prepare for, uh, be ready for, for worse outcomes than, than that. So I think, you know, lower quality, uh, weaker uh, companies, you want to be careful there. So, Andrew, g give me a sense of, are you looking at worst case scenario and best case scenario? And if you look at worst case, what does that look like? Well, I think, you know, when you have a recession, it's easy to forecast a a shallow recession. Um, a lot of there's not a lot of um, imbalances in the private sector. The um, uh, you know the, the initial conditions look okay. So the baseline for a, a shallow recession looks looks pretty reasonable. But when you start slowing down, it's very hard to to know how um, um, how much you're going to slow down. You know, central banking is a is a difficult job. They're trying to deliver um, soft landings, but there's huge amount of um, uncertainty. Um, in in this, but overall, you know, I think it's um, um, the 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 pattern in terms of the data. You're seeing the clear slowdown. You're seeing the um, the, the the impact of big tightening in financial conditions that we we um, saw last year. But the under, underlying um, imbalances um, being pretty reasonable give you a, a you know reasonable chance of yeah. a um, soft softish landing, if not a soft landing. Yeah. So, um, Andrew, very quickly, when you say, you know, there's a strong case for investing in bonds, what are your, your top three plays right now? Well, I think core bonds look pretty attractive given the, the starting yields. You had a big repricing um, last year, so that was painful. But the, 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 the level of yields looks um, quite attractive. So, you know, core bond funds or with some more credit, um, um, credit orientated funds um, give you very... Um, very good, we think, starting yields going into this period of, um, of recession. So, you know, keeping it simple and um, core bonds um, and then up in quality uh, in terms of credit and other sectors, maybe EM. There's no reason to be uh, down in quality given the yields available for the, um, for the higher quality assets. So um, core bonds look pretty attractive and um, we think you can achieve, you know, good returns with... Um, yeah. Um, assets, IG or um, US agency mortgages say we don't need to to go to um, lower parts of the credit spectrum where you do have um, you know more risk in the event of worse than expected uh, macro outcomes. Yeah. 
Um, Andrew, let me also bring in Joyce Chang, Chair of Global Research at JP Morgan. We're lucky enough, actually, to have her in London this week. So, Joyce, thank you. You put out this great note, which is actually also quite long-term, so you look at the next decade and some of the pitfalls, and you talk about the great repricing research. What is, is the most overvalued or thing that, you know, people are getting wrong right now? Well, first, I, I just want to say that um, on the long term, we have had fixed income reprice. And so when we look at 6040, which had just such a terrible year last year, we're looking at over the next decade, could you get 6.7%? Now, back in 2020, we said that you would only get three and a quarter percent from 6040. So that's a big change. Um, so with this great repricing, we've had just a boost to future yeah. returns. And I think you will see allocations um, to fixed income coming back here. Yeah. I also I also think you're going to see more of a rotation into international as well, okay. um, just yeah. when we take a look at valuations. So, just when you look at fixed income, where would you be cautious? So, uh, look, I think that uh, you know, we've had credit spreads actually um, tighten faster than what we've seen in the equity yeah. market. And so, you know, high yield, we're inside a lot of the targets that we have for the end of the year already. Now, I still like high grade. Um, we're looking at total returns this year could, that could still be around 8%. 2% excess returns, still a lot of upgrades, but you know, high yield right now, some of the valuations are looking very tight. And even in EM credit, some of the valuations are looking very tight. So we like local markets better yeah. in emerging markets. And, and Andrew, I mean, going back to some of the things that you were saying, how do you play China right now through, through your space? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty there over the, the, the reopening and the economic path. I mean, from the global economy um, uh, perspective, reopening there is you know, a significant positive, and you've seen the um, equity market reaction, broader um, market reactions. I mean, as, as a tactical position, I think uh, in, in fixed income space, it makes sense to be underweight um, government bonds in, in China. We saw the big repricing of, of global um, fixed income last year. We have not seen that in, in China. You know, you know it's, 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 it's a market which uh, has a lot of government involvement. So um, um, uh, none of these things are certain. But it seems, it seems a good prospect that with successful, hopefully, um, reopening um, in China, that um, you, you'll see the move higher in yields we've seen elsewhere in the world. So do, can you actually, Andrew, with conviction, say that if we have a CPI print in the U.S. today that's pretty much in line, it means that, you know, amongst the developed uh, markets, the U.S. is definitely leading this kind of, you know, if not deflationary, less inflationary environment? So you, you have had um, good indications in terms of inflation. We should be very um, wary. No one's won any prices um, recently for inflation forecasting. But... Um, um, there is, you know, there are good indications that inflation is moderating. Our forecast is um, for inflation um, moderating this year. Uh, with the data today and then over the next months, um, you know, the, clearly the thing to watch for is um, the extent to which um, market expectations for central banks, you know, the, the sort of terminal points um, that we have priced in um, are going to look, um, um, uh, you know, more reasonable. Or, I mean, the, the, the tail risk today and, and going forward is if we do have higher inflation prints, um, labor markets remain strong. If central banks are forced yeah. to go further, then again, that could be difficult for um, global asset markets and particularly, we think, for the more um, the lower quality parts of those, um, those markets. So, Joyce, what does that mean? We, we saw a bit of a rally, right, in U.S., I guess, late into last year. What happens this year? Yeah, it was a very front-loaded rally. Yeah. <laughs> and as I said, that some of the year-end targets we've set, we're already at those targets or inside of those targets. So I think you're going to see some of this U.S. rally fade, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world is sort of playing catch-up and some convergence here. And in China, you know, the story is really consumption. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, it, you still, I wouldn't underestimate the reopening, mm -hmm. even with the high infection rate and some of the concerns. I mean, China has you know, basically been shuttered for three years, and reopening is going to be a big boost to consumption. I mean, consumption used to be about four percentage points of the contribution to GDP, so that still yeah. could be a very big uplift. At the same time, there's real disinflation also happening in emerging markets countries. Yeah, and actually, I mean, in your calls, your, your three boldest calls, Joyce, are probably overweight UK and overweight Japan. Well, yeah, look, the UK was the best performer last yeah. year. It's 
still has the highest dividend yield. It still uh, has exporters who are benefiting from you know, the weakness of the currency and the valuations are still there. So we've kept that one on. And where we did not see a front loaded rally was with the change in yield curve control. We saw Japan really sell off. And as we look across the developed markets, I mean, this is a year where Japan looks like it's actually going to outperform you know, most of the developed markets. And if there is an inflation overshoot, the one place that does benefit would actually be Japan. So we do stay with the overweight on Japan here. And, and Andrew, what's your take on UK guilds, but also corporates? Well, you know, look, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we have 2% on the fiscal that is really backloaded, yeah. but I do think that, you know, the financial stability concerns that had yeah. surfaced, they have gotten those under control. Yeah. So I am, you know, very comfortable staying with the UK okay. overweight on the equity market. Okay. And Andrew, what about you in the UK? Pretty neutral on, um, on gilt markets. Uh, I think... Um, UK residential um, mortgages, uh, backed securities um, look um, look look quite attractive. So that's something that we we have, but fairly neutral on on gilts here. The you know the expectations priced in for the Bank of England look pretty reasonable. All right. So thank you both for joining us. Andrew Balls, Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income at PIMCO. Thank you, of course, with his uh, great report out today. And Joyce Chang, Chair of Global Research at J.P. Morgan, stays with us. Now coming up, plenty more to discuss ahead of that U.S. inflation print that's due out later today, 1.30 p.m. UK time. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we're back with Joyce Chang, Chair of Global Research at JP Morgan. Uh, Joyce, we're talking a little bit about Fed, Fed expectations, inflation. Overall, I mean, there's this dynamic over the last 12 months between the markets and Fed officials where they talk tough, they talk tough, and the markets kind of shrug it off. I mean, is this going to be, the, the, you know, once again, the story of 2023? Yeah, I, I, look, I think the markets have to realize that the Fed is not your friend, necessarily. And I do think there's two more 25 basis point you know, hikes, and then there is a um, pause, but there's not a pivot. Yeah. Um, I would call it a high hold, and I think that's, the market has to look at what the Fed is actually communicating to them. And I think the, the, the Fed is concerned that just the, that you know the market performance doesn't necessarily reflect the language that they have yes. been com communicating consistently across the governors. But so why? Why is this happening, Joyce? I, I, th I, I think that just because you know we hit the peak of so many of the numbers right now that everybody is talking about the pivot in the marketplace. And I think what the Fed is saying is that even though we've seen the peak. We have some massive disinflation. We're still far away from the target. And the Fed, you know, having not gotten it right as inflation was going up, they can't afford to not get it right, you know, this time. So I think it's a high hold. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's a mild recession at the end of this year, but probably the most well-telegraphed recession that we've ever seen. And without the balance sheet, um, you know, challenges that we've seen during previous slowdowns. So, you know, I, that, that's the key message I would have is that, you know, this market already saw a very front-loaded rally. It may see a bit of a pushback. You really have to look at valuations now. And maybe some of the international stuff makes more sense here. So but does the labor market hold both in the U.S. and, and main European countries? Look, we see an uptick in unemployment, um, you know, you know, but we're looking at, you know, 4.3, 4.4 as we look over the course of the year. I mean, look, a lot of the labor market conditions are structural. It's about immigration policy. It's about the demographics. So I think you will see an uptick in unemployment. Um, what you're going to really see, though, is a drop in the excess savings. So remember that excess savings were over $2 trillion in 2021. Yeah. It's about $800 billion now, and by the second half of the year, that excess savings cushion yeah. will be gone. And that's when I think you see the consumers actually begin to take more of a hit. The margin compression will come in. The earnings forecast will have to come down later in the year. Um, Joyce, what do you do with the energy complex? So this was, you know, the, the biggest surprise is, is probably that we're in a better shape, certainly in Europe, with energy and energy reserves than we were back in 2022. 
Yeah, and we've also had a very mild winter Which helps. as well. So structurally, um, we still have um, you know a bullish long-term call on yeah. the commodities market and this yeah. whole deglobalization. But short term, we do have tactical that you know a short energy trade right now, which we'd put on a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and that seems to be bearing fruit right now. But if we look at this more longer term, we haven't changed the longer term forecast yeah. that we have for Brent. I mean, we're still looking at you know ninety dollars. We're still looking at um, you know eighty dollars over the medium term as sort of what you need given what the capex needs are in the yeah. large oil companies. So um, if we look at equities, if you look at the big indices, which one will outperform? Is the S&P going to be you know, higher than, than it is now by the end of the year? I think it will be a, 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 you know, a bit higher. I mean, we have 4,200 okay. as okay. the target here. So we do see um, room for the S&P uh, you know, to go higher over the course of the year. But I do think that you know, from uh, November onwards, you had a front-loaded rally that hit the credit markets yeah. you know, and the equity market. So we are a little bit more cautious here. I think the way to play some of this disinflation trade could be through rates coming down yeah. in emerging markets and some of the international equities. So we're internationally. I know it's one maybe, you know, some of the equity valuations that look attractive, but you're also expecting, I don't know if it's global or European earnings per share to fall 10% this year. Yeah, yeah no, you're, you're, we'd rather do the UK over Europe, but I do think there's a China reopening trade okay. that will still play out, particularly in the consumption and the services yeah. side. And we have taken up our China growth forecast. Yeah. I mean, we still have it below the official target. You know, we have 4.4% growth in China, but I think that you will see a lot of pent-up demand. And the second largest economy in the world reopening is still big news, even if it does fit some setbacks. Is a certain sectors, when you talk about retail, is it luxury? Uh, or elsewhere. Yeah, well, uh, well, I would say that more of the you know, like like consumer sectors, I think, are going to do better here, just given um, just what a big percentage of the economy that is. And um, I also think that in China, some of the housing problems probably peak. They have more of a strategy now that even though they're uh, still going to have ongoing challenges. So I would still say with more of the consumer sectors in China right now. I mean, the biggest pitfalls geopolitics, which we still don't really know how to yeah. price, and then of course volatility. Do you worry about liquidity as well? Well, you know, I, I worry about the geopolitics first because, you know, particularly in the United States, um, you know, Kevin McCarthy finally made it through that whole, uh, you know, Speaker of the House, but he has, you know, um, said that he will form a select China committee, that there will be talk about yeah. more export restrictions, yeah. um, investment restrictions. Could there even be a trip to Taiwan? Yeah. So I think we have to watch the geopolitics first. Yeah. The market liquidity has been a challenge across a lot of different markets. I mean, yeah. China included, but I mean, look, we saw what happened in the gilts market and even in the treasury market this past year. So that remains an ongoing, I think, chronic concern across a lot of the markets. And emerging markets are less liquid. Joyce, thank you so much. As always, Joyce Chang there, uh, Chair of Global Research at JP Morgan. Now, coming up later this hour, the UK's winter of discontent deepens. That's as 100,000 civil servants announce strike action next month. Stay with us for more on the UK and politics. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Guerin. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Advisors to FTX have found more than $5 billion in cash or digital assets that the failed crypto group may be able to sell to help repay creditors. A company lawyer told the judge overseeing the bankruptcy that it is working to monetize assets, including many that do lack liquidity. More than 9 million customer accounts have been affected so far. The UK and Japan have signed a major defence pact which will allow military forces to be deployed to one another's territory. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and his Japanese counterpart Fumio Kishida reached the agreement here in London which will allow for larger, more complex joint military exercises. It comes as Tokyo expands bilateral cooperation amid concerns about China's rise 
highs. China's factory gate prices fell more than expected in December as the sudden end to COVID zero held up factory operations. The official PPI fell 0.7% from a year earlier. Economists surveyed by Bloomberg expected a 0.1% drop. Meanwhile, consumer inflation rose to 1.8% in the year to December, and that was in line with expectations. And U.S. authorities are working to determine what went wrong in an outage that prompted a nationwide flight stoppage yesterday. The Federal Aviation Administration have confirmed an earlier Bloomberg report pinning the likely blame on a damaged database file, saying there's no evidence of a cyber attack. At one point, an estimated 9,000 flights were delayed across the U.S. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, stocks are climbing all eyes, of course, on that U.S. inflation report a little bit later on. Uh, look, what traders are saying is that they're really wagering that the U.S. inflation is cooling, reducing pressure for aggressive rate hikes from uh, the Fed. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on that. Treasury is also creeping higher, adding to gains in U.S. recession, while a gauge of dollar strength seems to be little changed as we speak. Investors looking beyond the drum, big hawkish comments from Fed officials. All right, coming up, but we have our U.K. special. We delve into the discontent and disruption gripping the U.K. and how the recovery can be driven by small and medium-sized companies. We'll be speaking to the EMEA president of software group Sage. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a new show with a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services, and markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, on the show this week, the biggest industrial action by the public sector in years. 100,000 civil servants plan to strike next month over wages and inflation, ramping up the pressure on the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Also on the show, retailers are less positive about the year ahead, despite some seeing a sales boost from the Christmas period. We'll break down the latest results. Plus, the EMEA president of software group Sage tells us how small and medium-sized companies will help drive the economic recovery in the UK and what the government can actually do to help. So the strikes roll on. 100,000 UK civil servants plan to walk out next month, adding to existing disputes in health care, on the railways and elsewhere. The action comes as the government plans new laws to limit disruption from future strikes. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by our Bloomberg senior reporter for international affairs, Mark Champion, and our Bloomberg senior reporter on UK wealth, John Stepik. So, uh, John and Mark, thank you both for joining us. John, first of all, when you look at the economic impact of the strikes, like how bad are they? I mean, in terms of the overall GDP impact, it's actually quite small. Um, that's partly because what happens is whenever a strike happens, economic activity is actually displaced rather than, than ditched. Um, so, like, if you can't get to work on the train, you spend your money, you know, in your local cafe at home. Um, so it, that's relatively minor. I mean, obviously, if you're somebody who needs an ambulance on the day the ambulance workers are on yeah. strike, that's a completely separate issue. Mm -hmm. But in terms of actual economic impact, it's, it's, it's more the strikes are more a symptom of our wider economic problems. Yes. Yes. So they're happening because yeah. inflation is going up rather than the other way around. Yeah. Obviously, what government and central banks worry about is that then that starts to feed off itself. Right. So right. inflation creates yeah. strike action, strike action creates higher wages and so on. At the moment, it's hard to argue we're seeing a wage price spiral, though, I think. But, but you could, and, th and this is kind of like a feedback loop. And I guess, you know, politically, for Rishi Sunak, he's, you know, he hasn't been in charge for that long. He's dealing with a number of issues, but this could be very, very dangerous for him. It's really bad for him. I mean, you, he was in a difficult position in any way. He's, you know, this is 13 years into conservative government. Um, they've had a lot of trouble, you know, that he replaced um, a kind of crash and burn effort at an a administration. Um, and, you know, here he is, uh, you know, having to deal with really uh, rolling strikes that are becoming wider. Um, and you could argue that um, he uh, may have misjudged. 
yeah. uh, back in uh, early December when you know it became clear that the NHS in particular was going to go on strike. Yeah. There's a huge amount of sympathy with the NHS, especially after COVID. Um, people know that these, you know, the nurses and so on are underpaid, they're understaffed, in part because of Brexit, which was also conducted by the government. So, uh, you know, you, it really is a, a pretty nasty and, cocktail. And, and Mark, I guess I don't know whether the public is behind at all. The, I mean, these anti-strike legislation is, is, could be really damaging, right? So the, it's basically assuring a minimum service yeah. no matter what happens. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a high-risk uh, strategy, and it follows on from that decision early in December to sort of take a tough line. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you could argue, because the polls suggest that, uh, in particular, to do with the NHS, but you know, more widely, the public supports the unions, not the government. Um, so this may be, you know, it may prove to be rather tin-eared. Yeah, so, John, are we going to see an increase in a lot of these salaries? And again, is there a concern that actually inflation, you know, a lot of people, and I think the public is fairly behind a lot of the NHS workers saying nurses absolutely need a bigger salary, but that you increase that salary by 10, 12, 15 percent, and then inflation comes down? Well, I, I, I suppose what I would say is I don't, I don't think it's necessarily about exactly whether the nurses get a pay rise or not. Yeah. Um, I mean, to, to my mind, the, the, the issue with the, the strikes is, is partly political um, and it's also been driven by the cost of living going up. Yeah. If, the, if the wider cost of living starts to, if the increases in the cost of living start to slow this year, as seems likely, then some of the impetus behind continuing strike action might be taken away. The problem at the moment, I feel, is that the unions have got the bit between their teeth. They can smell the blood of a, as you say, a kind of like 13-year-old Conservative government. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take quite a lot of, uh, I think, probably maybe the government backing down a bit and some of these things for it to take any of the, the heat out of the debate. And we're not seeing that happen at the moment. But John, overall, is the economy in the UK improving? I mean, we've had such bad figures that I don't, you know, I don't know how much lower we could go from here. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's... You know, when you look at the corporate results since Christmas, the trading updates have all been much, much better than you would have expected if you'd been, you know, just reading the headlines before Christmas. I mean, Next, Tesco, Marks and Spencer, Sainsbury's, a Premier Inn owner, Whitbread, they've all come out with either solid or actually strong results. Um, so it does appear that the consumer is still spending and ultimately the UK is a consumer-driven economy. And as long as the consumer doesn't go on strike, then you know, the wider economy itself is probably going to be OK. I mean, we're probably maybe in a technical recession just yep. now. And, you know, and that, that's two quarters of GDP yep. uh, not growing. Um, but at the same time, I think it might end up being milder than a lot of people right. expect. And I think <clears> that the headlines and also the, the overall kind of toxic politics that we've had for the past year are sort of creating an impression in the UK that I think probably isn't actually necessarily yeah. borne out by the underlying either economic performance or investment performance of uh, companies in general. Yeah, and actually the earnings, you're right. I mean, we had a Maness and another one, and, you know, sales are OK, but they've had to really fight for their margins. So they're trying to keep that yeah. shopper loyal because they, they may switch to cheaper brands. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah. you're right. But I think it's, the thing is, if you... If you were sort of reading the headlines about strike action and the kind of trains going on strike and, yeah. and, and snowstorms and all the rest of it in December, you would have expected, you know, I mean, I think people were thinking that well, somebody's going to come out with a whopper or a profit warning. Yes. And as it turns out, you know, mm -hmm. we have had profit warnings, but they've been from direct line, which is completely yeah. different reasons. Um, and also Halfords this morning, but Halfords, again, is, is kind of specific it, to that yes. company rather than a result of the wider economy. And, and Mark, the number of calls I've gotten from like, you know, French friends or, or, you know, French journalists and Italians saying, what is going on in the UK? You're becoming so French because of the strikes. Have we really seen anything at this scale in the UK before in terms of people taking to the streets to show how unhappy they are? Not for a really long time. And people sort of, uh, you know, they look back to the, the, the winter of discontent, which was, you know, back in the late 70s. Um, but it was, you know, if, if anything, I think some of the wrong lessons are being drawn. You know, some of the same things are happening, high inflation, the government worried about stoking that and therefore, you know, going to bat with the, the unions. But it was a Labour government. Margaret Thatcher followed. Um, and also, you know, it, it, the UK was sort of coming out of, I mean, it had just gone to the IMF for money. It was basically bankrupt. Um, so, um, you know, at, as tough as people feel this t is, um, you know, we're not quite in the same position as John yeah. was saying.
We also, so the London mayor, you know, is warning today that uh, Brexit has done immense damage to the city. I know, John, you pushed back against this a couple of weeks ago. I mean, is this, are we now going, is the narrative shifting actually to we need to minimize Brexit or is this um, a, a red herring? I, I think it's a red herring. Um, I think it's a very useful stick to beat the government with because obviously, you know, the government has and is heavily identified with Brexit and obviously the Tory party is massively divided on that front. So it is, it's very useful kind of thing to hit the, the government with. Um, I, I do think there's probably a, also an element of trying to kind of bring Brexit back to the forefront of the, the oh. political arguments now that COVID is starting to go you know, into the, the distance again. And obviously Sadiq Khan's a kind of high profile mm -hmm. remainer. So mm -hmm. it, as Mandy Rice Davis sort of said, you know, he would say that, wouldn't he? So, you know, I don't think um, red herring. Is all, right, all right, there you go. <laughs> John Stepick on Brexit and, of course, our London mayor. Mark, thank you so much, Mark Champion. John Stepick will be back in a couple of weeks joining us this morning on the UK. Coming up, small and medium enterprises will lead the recovery in the UK economy, but they need more government support to do so. That's SAGE EMEA President Derek Bleeker and what he believes. So we speak to him next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Frontin Lacroix here in London. Now, just a reminder, we're keeping an eye on all things markets and extending gains to 1%. This is, as there's a lot of speculation from BOJ and, of course, a policy that does this comes from traders uh, gaining to 1% amid some of the speculation. Again, remember, we've had a really big news stories <coughs> from the <coughs> Bank of Japan over in December, and then we also have Governor Kuroda stepping down in April. There's speculation about who will, of course, um, you know, be well, come after him and traders really piling on bets about another hawkish pivot from the Bank of Japan following this report that the central bank will now review the side effects of its policy as soon as next week. We've also had a string of UK retailers reporting this morning, which benefited from a Christmas boost, including Tesco and M&S. The outlook for the year, though, is less optimistic. We'll dig into the numbers now with our Katie Linsell, our UK retail reporter. So, Katie, talk us through some of these retail earnings. What are you seeing? Yes, good morning, Francine. So the key ones to look at today are Tesco and Marks & Spencer. Both retailers showed that sales rose quite significantly in the Christmas period, but both are saying that they expect their profit outlook to be held. They are not upgrading. They do not expect better than they had previously told the market. And in both cases, they've seen shares fall slightly this morning as investors had hoped for better. So it shows that really their margins are continuing to be squeezed by the cost of living crisis. They're doing everything they can to try and keep prices low, they say, for consumers. But it really shows that that's, that's eating into their margins. Another interesting retailer to look at is ASOS, the fast fashion online retailer. ASOS has been having a very tough time. Their sales actually fell in the period. And they are guiding that they're going to be loss making in the first half. Off. But despite that, their shares are actually up because they are telling investors that their turnaround is making progress and they are hopeful that they can see some signs of profitability ahead. All right, Katie, thanks so much. Uh, Katie Linzel there, our UK retail reporter with the very latest earnings. Now, the UK increasingly facing a perfect storm as the economy grapples with the cost of living crisis, rising industrial action and political inertia. Now, a report by Sage Group, the FTSE 100 provider of financial and HR services to small and medium-sized businesses, sees SMBs as key drivers for the UK's economic recovery. The report, though, says they need more government support. So for more on this, we're joined by Derek Bleeker. He's EMEA president at SAGE. Thank you um, for joining us. There's so much actually going on in the UK and such bad news out there. Can it only get better from here? What are you seeing among small and medium sized enterprises? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, look, I think obviously uh, there's no denying the UK is in a difficult place right now. Yeah. Um, but we do see a lot of optimism and a lot of reasons for optimism. And as a report, um, tries to tries to uh, point out um, if we look at the drivers of economic recovery from, for example, the great financial crisis, small and mid-sized businesses are key to doing that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, and Dirk, one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is actually leverage. And I'm surprised, and I don't know whether this comes in the second half of this year, that not more small companies, medium companies want BAS because interest rates ha have gone up by so much. I think uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. A lot of that has to do with uh, the adaptability, ultimately, and resilience of small businesses. They can make fast decisions, pivot quickly, innovate quickly, which gets them out of, obviously, then means that they're driving revenue growth and it gets them out of any financial, uh, financial issues. But financial access is absolutely a key um, uh, driver to making sure that small businesses can support the economy going forward. So you don't, you don't think there's like, you know, zombie companies that are going to go bust in, in the second half of the year? There's not a doomsday scenario for smaller companies where, you know, financing and where they were over leveraged? We don't see a doomsday scenario at the moment. Um, uh, speaking to our customers, they're trying to work their way through what is a difficult time. Um, but they're doing that by innovating and okay. trying to grow their business. So where do you see the, the biggest growth actually for small and medium-sized companies in the UK? I know if you're a retailer, exempt, you, you've been hit quite hard, um, certainly in the beginning because of Brexit and some of the tariffs going to and fro for Europe. Is this stabilizing? So if you look at um, the report again, uh, points to the professional scientific and technology yeah. uh, sector as a, as a key driver, both in the great financial crisis and an expected key driver of uh, economic growth from SMBs going forward. Uh, so where do you see, if you look at the next 12 months, I know we've had such bad news and you're pretty optimistic about the future. Is this just one of trying to, I, I guess, keep your margins, keep your customers loyal, and then you increase next year? Like what kind of timeline do you see over the next two to three years for growth? Um, well, look, as a company, Sage itself, we see, um, uh, you know, we continue to have uh, a good growth momentum, as you saw in our previous year's financial results. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and, and we are a very resilient business, right? Um, we believe in the SMB economy. The SMB economy is proving us right, um, has proven us right to date over many years. So we continue to see strong resilience. And, and are you getting enough support from the government? Are small businesses, medium businesses, and tech businesses in general here in the spotlight of the current government? I think there's a, there's a, uh, a lot that um, you know, politicians of both, uh, across both parties are trying to do. Um, but there is a lot more that we can do. And we really, at Sage, we believe in the digitization of the economy. Yeah. And government has a pivotal role in, in trying to digitize the economy further. Supporting small businesses to adopt digital technology is a key uh, part of that. I mean, are you frustrated? It feels like it's been slow. I feel like we've been talking about digitization and, you know, more technology for the last four to five years. We have. But if you look at the, the pace of digital technology adoption, especially through COVID, it's accelerated immensely. Uh, so I wouldn't say that we're frustrated. I think there's just so much more opportunity. Um, you know, we did a, a report last year that pointed out there's a £230 billion pound revenue opportunity um, for small business just from higher digital technology adoption. Dirk, thank you so much. Dirk Bleeker there, EMEA president at Stage. He stays with us. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, on Bloomberg UK. Coming up, ditching office space. We take a look at how the tech downturn has impacted commercial real estate next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Alphabet, Meta and software giant Salesforce are among the latest U.S. tech firms looking to ditch their leased office space in London. That's as the cooling economy brings the sector's years of rapid expansion to a halt. But it's not a London-only phenomenon. We look at what's behind the retreat. Following years of rapid expansion, the global tech sector took a monumental hit in 2022, crashing stock prices, surging interest rates and an ever-darkening economic outlook forced big tech firms to cut costs. And after slashing jobs at a pace like the early days of the pandemic, fangs have started offloading office space too. Meta, Alphabet and software giant Salesforce are among global tech groups ditching offices in London as they downsize European operations. Just over a year ago, these were the very same companies sparing no expense in renovating their shiny buildings in the British capital. 
Google spent a billion dollars on its central St. Giles's complex and built a new campus in King's Cross, equipped with swimming pools, gyms and massage rooms. Facebook followed suit with a new 40,000 square metre space to house over 6,000 UK employees. Last quarter, parent Meta estimated charges related to global office facilities would hit $2 billion this year. So what happened? Certainly the market crash killed some of London's appeal. At one point in November, the UK even lost its crown as Europe's biggest stock market to Paris. But the challenge is global, with offices in tech hubs such as Dublin and even San Francisco being emptied following massive layoffs. Bloomberg has logged some 81,000 job cuts in tech over the past year, with Amazon and Salesforce announcing more than 25,000 last week alone. But it isn't all gloom in London. TikTok was said to be in talks late last year to lease new space close to its current UK headquarters. So is the social media sensation the only company still able to dance its way through the big tech downturn? Ah, TikTok. A lot of us have an account. A lot of us don't use it. Maybe we should look at what's driving big tech's retreat from commercial real estate. So we're back with Dirk Bleeker, EMEA president at Sage. Dirk, when you look at commercial real estate, I mean, is it something that, you know, it's affected, that, that has the um, trend affected Sage? It's not affected Sage. And, uh, you know, we're, we're still in our offices um, uh, and not seeing these kind of trends. I do, you know, we have to take these things into perspective, right? Big tech obviously um, uh, likes to invest to grow and occasionally that means they have to, to pull back a bit. Um, but you know what, it also shows why we have to make sure that we rely on small and mid-sized businesses to drive the next wave of growth to come out of this economy because they're going to lead it. Yeah. But if you look at small and medium-sized enterprises, I, mean, I guess the biggest challenge is pacing their staff enough, right? And the cost of living crisis, I don't know whether it's staff retention, it's finding the right staff because of the skills shortage and paying them. It is, um, especially skills and, and finding the right staff. Uh, is a, we hear that across you know, mid-sized businesses, small business and big businesses. Um, and it, you know, the, uh, the, that's not gone away in, even in these times. It's a, it's a structural problem that we need to solve all the way to the ground up from the education system. Uh, so that takes years to fix. Is there, I mean, are, are you finding, you know, is it a struggle to find staff? So we're very lucky in that we, um, we have a, a global age quarter in Newcastle which is a fantastic place to find amazing talent um, uh, and that has kept us going for a lot of years in trying to uh, find fantastic staff and we invest a lot in making sure we um, both uh, work with schools in the area to bring STEM skills, take apprentices and then make sure that we invest in our, our people in Newcastle and of course across the world to make sure they have the right skills to do their jobs. I mean, there has been this, you know, north-south divide or London and everything else in the UK divide. And previous governments have really promised to, to try and, um, I guess, bridge that gap to bring them closer. Has that worked? I think there's a lot more to do, if I'm honest. If you look across the country, obviously, um, uh, there is still a big disparity in London and the rest of the, of the country. But um, uh, we strongly believe that the north-south divide uh, has no real reason to exist if we look at our presence in the northeast. Again, you can find the talent, you can find the people, and it's a fantastic place to be a global company. All right, Dirk, thank you so much for joining us. Dirk Bleeker, their EMEA president at Sage. Now, be sure also to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast that I host alongside David Merritt on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So actually, this week we focus on banker bonuses and the fact that a lot of them will get a donut. I had to Google what that meant. It's a big fat zero. So it's a focus on bonuses and, of course, some of uh, the staff being laid off at some of the big banks. So Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition is next with Matt Miller, Katie Lyons in New York, and Anne Edwards in London. The big story of the day, apart from these strikes in the UK and focus on GDP in the UK, is, of course, stocks in Europe are gaining ahead of that CPI data print in the U.S. What does that mean if we have a U.S. inflation print cooling? Does it reduce pressure for aggressive rate hikes from the Fed? This is Bloomberg. As we move further into this year, as the environment gets increasingly challenging with the high rate environment, with the, the clouds hanging over the broader growth outlook, you're going to see businesses get more cautious. This is going to be remembered as a V year 
when uh, we recognized that we were headed into a different kind of financial era. We will probably see that recovery within 2023, but not soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Stunning violence in Brazil's capital. Security forces have regained control after thousands of supporters of former President Bolsonaro stormed Congress and the presidential palace. A ship that ran aground in the Suez Canal has now been refloated. That reopens one of the world's most crucial waterways for global trade. And it's one of Goldman Sachs' biggest rounds of job cuts ever. More than 3,000 jobs will be eliminated at the Wall Street firm. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Kayleigh Lines is on assignment. Matt, uh, good morning to you. It seems that animal spirits reignited by, well, weakness in U.S. data. Yeah, absolutely. The rally that we saw uh, last week at the end of the week on Friday um, was the biggest we've seen in a month in U.S. stocks. And that uh, optimism uh, really made its way around the world. We see uh, big gains in uh, Asian stocks as well. It helps, of course, that they've dropped their COVID zero policy and they've dropped quarantines to enter the country. So now there's an influx of people, uh, a lot of, I guess, um, families reuniting as Hong Kongers come back to the mainland. So that's part of the rally. MSCI Asia Pacific gaining about 1.7 percent. The Hang Sang up a little bit more, 1.9 percent this morning. Um, the Nikkei in Japan is making some smaller gains uh, as well. And we see the dollar um, today uh, strengthening against the yen. Right now, 132 yen is the amount you can get for one dollar. Remember, we were all the way up at 146, 147, but we've been down in the 120s as well. In terms of U.S. futures, we are up this morning. It's not the same thing as you see um, in the, the Asian session, but of course we had ours on Friday, so now we're up a third of 1% there. And we really see moves that set us up for a bigger rally. You see a weak U.S. dollar uh, and that's uh, adding to gains in crude. It's adding to gains in Bitcoin right now, 17,247. So actual movement there on Bitcoin out of the $16,000 range. I will say, though, that as investors sell debt, the U.S. 10-year yield is rising. And those rising yields rival, of course, the yields that you get in stocks. So setting up a little bit of a competition there. Anna, what do you see in terms of the European markets? Yeah, as U.S. futures push a little higher, we push in aggregate a little higher on European equity markets, Matt, even though uh, the picture across the map is a little uh, mixed right now. Flat markets, negative markets in some places, but otherwise seeing some strength. Scandinavia looking pretty strong. The French market being down, uh, weighed downwards by a downgrade on Danone, which is a food business, of course, heavily weighted in that particular market. So a mixed picture, but overall making gains lifted by uh, the weaker data out of the United States, having an impact on expectations around interest rates, but also, as you point out, Matt, uh, the strength in the reopening story coming out of China. And it's the latter of those that's perhaps pushing higher on Brent crude. You mentioned, Matt, the dollar impact. That's in the mix, too. But also uh, the growth story out of China finally lifting Brent. It hasn't been something that has been lifting commodity prices. And, and commodities actually were a bit confused by the, uh, the mixed nature of the data we got out of uh, Friday's U.S. session. Over to Brazil, though. Let's have a look at what we're seeing on a London-listed ETF of Brazilian assets. This in, uh, in relation to, of course, the weekend's developments, the violence we've seen in Brasilia. And so as a result, those Brazilian assets listed here in London down by 2.2%. Uh, this is an interesting story. A small games developer here in the UK, small in market cap terms, uh, but uh, ha is having an impact on other games developers, which is why I put it on my board today. Apparently not as many people playing the F1 manager game as they'd anticipated. Uh this business is the maker of that particular game. And as a result, very disappointing performance, they describe it as. And that stock goes down by 40%. AstraZeneca down a percent today, but this is a business uh, that is doing deals it's doing deals in the biotech space, spending $1.8 billion on a U.S. biotech business, and that being well-received by investors, but the sector a little bit weaker today on what is a risk-on uh, risk session broadly. All right, interesting stuff, uh, and we'll, I'll check in personally to the uh, F1 management game there. Let's get to <laughs> the big story of the morning. Brazilian security forces have regained control of Congress and other key government buildings after they were stormed by supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro. New president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, who was away at the time, has vowed to go after those who were responsible. There is no precedent for what these people have done. 
but these people will be punished. We are going to find the financers, and they will all pay with the force of law for this irresponsible, undemocratic gesture, this gesture of vandals and fascists. For more on this, let's get to Bloomberg's Rod Rodrigo Orwella. Rodrigo, what has been the reaction in Brazil? We heard uh, Lula's comments uh, just now. We know he, um, you know, wants to press charges to the full extent of the law. What else are we hearing? Well, we've uh, heard a lot of people come out who are not part of the Lula camp, who were uh, close to Bolsonaro during his time in, in government, all come out and say, you know, denounce this in some way or other, say that this uh, should not be happening, that this is wrong, this is illegal. Um, the word that's being used widely in Brazil is terrorism to refer to this. And on the more kind of specific legal side, the one of the Supreme Court justices um, during the, the early hours ordered that the governor of Brazilian state uh, be removed temporarily from his position. So this adds on to Lula's decision to intervene, as they say in Brazil, the state's power to control security forces there. Um, so that's the biggest political move. And there was also an order from a prosecutor to arrest the security secretary of Brazilian state, who was part of Bolsonaro's government in the day, and uh, whose whereabouts are unknown, though there is some talk that he's in Florida, which is where Bolsonaro is as well. Mm, uh, and I know you mentioned some of the wording being used here. I know that some have called this a coup attempt as well. Uh, coming just one week after the inauguration of the new president, the old but new returning president, uh, 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 Lula, of course. And up to now, a lot of the focus in terms of assets then, Rodrigo, had been on whether we were going to see more fiscal spending coming from the administration. How is this changing thinking around Brazilian assets? Yes, so we actually have a, a quite interesting uh, reaction today from our colleagues at Bloomberg in, in economics on this. There, there was obviously some uncertainty when Lula took over as to where he was going to, to go with his economic uh, agenda, and this put markets a bit on, on edge. Um, some of that has relaxed since then because he has, he has indicated there are certain things like labor reform that he will not push ahead with. So the initial kind of decline in the real relative to, to euro had, uh, had eased. However, the, the conclusion um, in, this, in this reaction is that there is likely to be more, um, more uncertainty, which is negative for the real, is negative for stocks. Um, unless, unless the government makes pretty clear in some way or other that they have completely done away with these protests and the situation and put it under con total control. Obviously, that will come down to seeing how the security forces act over the next few days and what kind of control the government has over them. But until that happens, there will be some uncertainty. The faster that uncertainty is put to, to bed, the, the faster markets will likely calm down and go back to where they were last week. OK, Rodrigo, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Rodrigo Orihuela with the latest on developments in Brazil. Another developing story we've been keeping an eye on, certainly in the early hours of the European morning. A ship has been refloated after running aground in the Suez Canal and briefly disrupting traffic in the waterway that's vital for global trade. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has been taking a closer look at what happened here. Danny? Yeah, and I, I know we're all sort of longing for the simpler time of 2021 when the biggest story was just a ship stuck in the <laughs> Suez Canal, but, but this really isn't that. First of all, it only took about six hours to get this thing, uh, four hours rather, to get this thing up uh, and floating again. It was just described as a technical failure. The Ever Given in 21, that took six days. So the impact here, I mean, you really can't compare them at all. And for what it's worth, this ship this time around, there wasn't really the risk that it would get stuck. It's half the size of the Ever Given. It held up about 20 ships. They're now back on their way just after delay. And the Ever Given, you'll recall, in 2021, it blocked about $10 uh, billion worth of marine traffic every single day. So this time around, things are up and moving again. A, a completely different story, Anna. Danny, thanks very much. Danny Berger with the parallels and lack of parallels with March 2021 20, and the Ever Given. Thanks to Danny for the update there. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Goldman Sachs is embarking on one of its biggest rounds of job cuts, planning to cut about 3,200 positions this week. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's finance managing editor, Michael Moore, who has uh, details for us. Michael, good morning. Give us a sense of how widespread, actually, this is. Which are the areas that are being affected by these job cuts? Yeah, it seems like you're seeing it across the firm. Uh, obviously, we've reported before that the consumer banking business, which has been an expensive push, is going to take 
the brunt of this in terms of at least proportionally, but you are seeing it in the banking unit, the trading unit that's done quite well this year. So it does seem to be across the board. And some of this might be, you know, a couple years worth of cuts that have kind of built up. Um, you know, in 2020, there was the pandemic. Not a lot of banks were cutting jobs. Mm. In 2021, it was perhaps the most active year ever. Banks were staffing up to try to keep up with that deal flow. So this is kind of, um, there's been some buildup, if you will. We have, obviously, uh, U.S. banks starting to report as well. Um, mm -hmm. A massive amount set to come out in one day. What are you expecting there? Yeah, I think, you know, what we've seen is uh, the investment banking side has been pretty slow. Uh, we're looking to see, you know, if there's going to be optimism for whether that changes in 2023. Uh, interest rates are helping on the lending side. The question is, how much is that offset by uh, credit provisions? And do the banks, you know, take a conservative view toward the economy uh, and need to put more money aside for that? You have six big banks coming on the 13th. Michael, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Bloomberg's Michael Moore covers banks for Bloomberg. Now let's get a look at some of the other stocks moving in pre-market trading in the U.S. this morning. First off, we're watching the iShares MSCI Brazil ETF. After the turmoil in Brasilia, it seems as though things are still being sorted out there, although fortunately uh, all of the government buildings have now been, I guess fortunate depending on whose side you're on, have been uh, uh, freed up there. And right now we see that uh, uh, iShares MSCI Brazil Index ETF down about 1.2%. Next off, NVIDIA. Very interesting story here in big tech. And remember how big NVIDIA actually is. Kathy Wood's um, uh, flagship fund, ARK, of course, sold more shares as the chipmaker rebounded from a nearly two-year low. But NVIDIA is still a $365 billion stock. So this is a company that is bigger than Tesla. And speaking of Tesla owners swarmed showrooms in China over the weekend to complain about missing out on another round of price cuts. Those uh, vehicles, some of the vehicles that Tesla sells in China are 40% lower than the same vehicles in terms of price um, made and sold here in the U.S., mm. Anna. Yeah, you're not getting over that one quickly, are you? That was one of our themes of last week. Uh, coming up on the program then, Matt, we'll talk to Karen Chedid, an investment strategist at BlackRock. If you think inflation is going to be sticky, if you think that Tesla prices stay high, uh, what does that do to your outlook for bond markets? Uh, and uh, we'll also delve into the outlook for corporates this year. 50 companies to watch in 2023. Coming up, we'll dive into a few of the details of which companies Bloomberg Intelligence has picked out on their watch list. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lyons is on assignment. And we are still, um, I guess, uh, wondering over and pondering what the labor report that we got on Friday means for the Fed and for the broader markets. We had hourly, uh, average hourly wage growth slow, but it's still climbing. And we had unemployment come down to 3.5%. That's the lowest level going all the way back to before even I was born in the 60s. <laughs> Joining us now to talk about what this means for the Fed is Bloomberg's macro strategist, Simon White. Simon, uh, you know, I can't help but think about Nehru, the non-accelerating inflationary rate of unemployment. It's got to be higher than 3.5%, right? Which means that we're still looking at inflationary numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's kind of interesting dynamics we have right now. You have, as you say, you've got this very low unemployment rate, um, but you have um, very, very big changes after COVID. So since, um, you know, the last three years, payrolls has added about 2 million, um, which compared to the civilian labour force, which is maybe up like 5 million, um, you know, it's a shortfall. Um, and the participation rate we know has gone down. And really, it's been concentrated in amongst the, the older workers, so like 55 plus people that left the labor force 
uh, you know, after COVID and, and probably have no uh, real desire to return. And that's really changing the dynamics. That's going to make the Fed's job a lot more difficult. Mm, and it's something that labour markets here in the UK have in common. There are differences, of course, but some, one of those themes, at least slightly in common with the US. So somebody found something kind of Goldilocks about what we heard about the labour market maybe on Friday. But also we got that services ISM print, which was really dire. And other people point to that and say that's actually what stocks rallied on. And was that well placed? Was it a good idea to rally on such dreadful uh, sort of forward looking data about the US economy? Sure, it impacts on what the Fed will do, but doesn't it just tell us something about how quickly recession is approaching? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense because, um, you know, I think it's very difficult to get a Goldilocks scenario in the first place. But if, uh, look, if we even are in that situation, the Fed is going to try and keep higher for longer. So it can't really be a good thing for stocks. But I would focus on what's leading here, right? So the services ISM is, is leading. New orders component within the ISM is also leading. That collapsed too. Mm. And if you look at uh, leading indicators, you look at the temporary help, uh, which is the part of the payroll and jobs report that's the most leading, that actually jumped to uh, negative growth. So we've now got negative growth in temporary help and mm. that leads to the overall jobs market. So all the leading indicators are telling you that maybe we've added, you know, it's a three months extra kind of uh, timeline to this, but the inevitability that jobs growth is going to start falling probably in the second half of the year is very high. Simon, we had a number of big names come out last week and warn that the Fed needs to be on lookout for lower than average inflation or even disinflation. You had the sensational Michael Burry um, tweet saying that in the second half of 2023, we're going to be in a recession by any measure. And then you had Raghuram Rajan, who has been saying for a while that the Fed needs to get ready for this kind of move. Um, are we expecting you know, inflation to come back down to earth and maybe even move lower in 2023? It could happen. I mean, it's, um, you know, I don't think inflation is necessarily mean reverting, but it can display some of these characteristics where things do overshoot when they go back. So I think you could have a possible period in the second half of this year where it does look like it's heading considerably lower. I don't think it's going to head to like extremely low levels, say sub 2%. I think what it will do, what it did in the 70s, the mid 70s, is it basically um, troughs at a slightly higher level. Um, so maybe it gets down to just pick a number, I don't know, three ish, three and a half, four, mm. um, and then kind of troughs, and people then start to worry about what happens next. It starts to rise again, and because it's rising from a higher plateau, potentially it makes uh, yet new highs later on in the cycle. OK, so if inflation troughs at higher levels than Simon, I mean, where does this leave the Fed in its assessment? We hear from uh, uh, Chair Powell tomorrow. Is he going to want to push back on some of the market response we've seen to data, which has been pretty risk on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, they, they, they kind of want to make absolutely sure that they get the job done. Unfortunately, they focus on lagging indicators. So there's a very high risk that they do too much. Um, and they push the economy into maybe a deeper recession than necessary. Uh, on the other hand, I think if they really do want to crush inflation and they want to do that first time round and not have to go through what happened in the 70s where mm. there's a few iterations, they probably do need to, to raise rates even more, like at maybe another 1% or 2%, but it's not really going to happen, right? They've not really got the mandate for the deep recession that they probably need to fully snuff out inflation. OK, doesn't seem to be uh, what the market is uh, dwelling on today, at least. US futures pointing another half percent higher. Simon, thank you very much. Bloomberg, Simon White with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Let's keep you up to date with news from around the world. Here's the first word. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak meets today with union leaders behind the strikes that have hobbled the country. Sunak is trying to avert further walkouts by rail, health or other workers. Unions want immediate pay hikes. According to The Guardian, Sunak may be open to a one-time payment to workers. China is trying to change the narrative that nationwide protests prompted President Xi Jinping to abandon his COVID-0 policy. According to a timeline published by the official news agency, the leadership started relaxing COVID restrictions before the protests began. On Sunday, China reopened borders that were largely shut for almost three years. 
And billionaire Jack Ma is giving up controlling rights of Ant Group. It's a sign that Ma is retreating further from his online empire following China's tech crackdowns. He's mostly disappeared from public view since giving a speech that criticized Chinese regulators on the eve of the scuttled ant listing in 2020. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., on Capitol Hill, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is rallying Republicans with promises to cut spending and strengthen border security. Still, in order to win the position, McCarthy had to give more leverage to the party's right wing. He promised a rule change that would allow a single lawmaker to call for a vote to oust the speaker. So I believe they will vote on that today, Anna, and it'll be interesting to watch this uh, Kevin McCarthy's 10-year kickoff after he needed 14 votes to be elected mm. Speaker of the House. Yeah, absolutely. So eventually getting there, taking days and breaking with sort of history and precedent in taking quite so long to elect a speaker and really underlining the difficulties that the House is going to have in passing any kind of policy, uh, given the power that now exists with uh, with a number of people uh, and really changing our assessment, perhaps, or making us revisit our assessment of what the midterms meant. We focus a lot at the time, perhaps, on the reduced influence of uh, the former President Trump and maybe not enough on the composition of the House. Right, coming up, we will get back to markets. Karen Cheddid joins us from BlackRock. What's his outlook for inflation? This is Blimpack. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Stunning violence in Brazil's capital. Security forces have regained control after thousands of supporters of former President Bolsonaro stormed Congress and the presidential palace. A ship that ran aground in the Suez Canal has now been refloated. That reopens one of the world's most crucial waterways for global trade. And it's one of Goldman Sachs' biggest rounds of job cuts ever. More than 3,000 jobs will be eliminated at the Wall Street firm. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Kayleigh Lines is on assignment today. And U.S. futures point higher, European stocks in the main on the rise then, Matt, as we focus on perhaps some of the Goldilocks elements of the U.S. data uh, and the China reopening story. Yeah, it seemed investors were pleased with the fact that wage growth slowed in the Friday non-farm payrolls report. And as a result, we had the biggest rally that we've had in a month in U.S. stocks. Now, Asian stocks uh, were up overnight. European stocks are gaining as well. And we have S&P futures rising about four-tenths of 1%. The yield on the 10-year is coming up, though, to almost 360, right now 359.30, as investors sell debt. Now, usually I feel like if they're selling debt, they have money left over to buy stocks. On the other hand, you do have a higher rate on the 10-year um, to compete with uh, the yield that you get on stocks. So there's always that uh, one hand or on the other hand story um, with the relationship between stocks and bonds. NYMEX crude rising as the dollar weakens and really dollar weakness is uh, a great risk on indicator for stocks today. We really do see dollar weakness as a result. Anything that's priced in dollars seems to be rising. Uh, uh, West Texas Intermediate up to $76.24 a barrel. Bitcoin rising as well out of that $16,000 range now at $17,262. Um, in terms of should we should we look at the pre-market movers here? Uh, we're always watching um, what happens around global turmoil. You have uh, the problems that we saw in Brasilia with supporters of Bolsonaro storming not only uh, Congress there, but the Supreme Court and the presidential palace. As a result, the ETF that follows Brazil stocks is down, although those uh, um, demonstrators, I guess you could call them demonstrators, have been pushed out and uh, 400 arrests were made. NVIDIA right now up 1.6%. Um, so NVIDIA showing gains even though Kathy Wood's flagship fund, ARK, sold more shares as the chipmaker um, rebounds from nearly two-year lows. It's a 360 uh, uh, billion dollar stock. So it's worth even more than Tesla. Tesla gaining as well almost 2% even though Tesla owners swarmed showrooms in China over the weekend to complain about missing out on another round of price cuts. You can now get some models uh, that Tesla produces in China for 40% less than uh, U.S. consumers will pay for those models made in America. Anna, what do you see in terms of European mm. stocks? 
Yeah, well, a couple of stocks there moving despite the news flow there, Matt. We've got European stocks moving higher, up by four-tenths of one percent, but actually a lot of dispersion, a lot of variation around that theme. Broadly, the China reopening story and some of the data out of the U.S. being weak enough to trigger risk-on sentiment, uh, that is, seems to be what is lifting markets. But we do have a lot of divergence between France and Spain on the one hand and the Scandinavian markets doing much better. Brent crude is up and energy stocks are one of the... Is, that's one of the sectors that is moving higher. Brent crude is up by three percent, perhaps deciding to focus on the reopening story out of China. It's been a difficult uh, difficult thing to try and pin down the relationship between that story and commodities. It's not been entirely uh, linear. This is the iShares MSCI Brazil ETF listed in London. So, Matt, you were talking about one of the pre-market ETF moves that you're seeing Brazil-related assets there on the move in the, U in the US. Well, here we're open and trading, of course, in London, and this is one of the ETFs that reflects that negativity around the politics. AstraZeneca is down by just over 1%. They're doing deals, AstraZeneca, over in the United Sp uh, States, spending 1.8 billion US dollars, which is maybe kind of small for a business the size of AstraZeneca. An analyst actually responding pretty positively to what they're doing here. But this is a sector that on a risk on day is struggling a little bit here in Europe, Matt. All right. So I'll keep paying attention to those stocks right now. I want to get to the bigger market picture with Karen Chetted. BlackRock, head of investment strategy for iShares EMEA. Karen, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Let me first ask you about that supposedly Goldilocks number that we got on Friday, the non-farm payrolls report. We added more than 200,000 jobs, but it was the least amount added in uh, 12 months. And the average hourly wage growth slowed. Um, does that mean that inflation is going to be kept under control and the Fed can ease off its monetary policy increases? Not quite. I mean, when we look at the payrolls number, I think, as you said, the Goldilocks term is coming back. They're not too hot, not too cold, uh, coming back into all market commentators' lingo. But I don't think it's time to bring back the Goldilocks playbook, market playbook, as it were, because this is different to uh, the Goldilocks of the past, uh, the past decade. Um, on the one hand, we did see that uh, wages are, are coming off uh, a bit. Uh, but when we consider where wages are relative to the Fed inflation target of 2%, we're still quite some distance from where the Fed wants it to be. So I don't think this is the mix that's going to get the Fed to, to back off. I think the Fed is very much focused on the hike and hold this year, as opposed to the reversal to cuts that the market is pricing in. So not the Goldilocks risk rally that we'd expect. OK, so Karim, I, I spoke to a, a good morning to you. I spoke to a couple of guests this morning who've been talking about the pace at which they think inflation is going to be coming down. One guest on Bloomberg Radio earlier on today was saying he's really in favour of fixed income right now because inflation is going to be dropping. I don't sense that you think inflation falls to such, you know, more normalised levels. So I think, you know, it's all about the uh, trajectory. So the, the, the drop from the peak to say 6% is much easier than the next leg of the drop in inflation down to that 2% that the Fed is still targeting. I think that next leg is going to be a little bit more, more stubborn. We're getting quite excited about the uh, disinflationary figures that we're getting. And obviously, we have the CPI on Thursday, so more to come. Um, but I think that next leg might surprise markets in how uh, persistent it, it, it could be. So does that limit your enthusiasm for fixed income then as a result? So actually, we we do prefer fixed income to equities. We do have an overweight on fixed income. And I think in that fixed income overweight, it depends where you're looking at. So duration might still be a bit more challenged for the points that we're discussing now around inflation and around just how carried away markets have gotten in terms of their pricing of the of the Fed versus what we think the Fed will do this year. But there are other pockets of fixed income that look pretty exciting, like credit, where we have a very strong preference versus, uh, versus equities. You're not concerned about a jump in defaults this year? I know uh, Matthew Mish at UBS, for example, has forecast we could get to 9% in terms of defaults. And even if you look at you know, other areas of um, uh, uh, credit, you've seen, for example, banks start to raise loan loss provisions. You've seen more leveraged loans um, mm -hmm. last year than you did any year since, I think, 2007. So, you know, you're starting to see the cracks appear. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are certainly some signs of stress starting to appear. And usually when, we, when you head into a recession, which we do think is, is playing out at the moment, you do want to be a bit more cautious with the credit risk that you're taking. But, um, you know, when you look at credit spreads, um, IG is an area where we do have uh, conviction. We do think that the valuations compensate you for those risks. And then when I bring it back to what we're seeing in ETF flows and what investor positioning looks like, it's been a pretty interesting ride for, for credit ETFs. If you look at the second part of 2022, you know, 2022 was a big year for fixed income. We hit a record with fixed income ETF flows. The first half of the year was all safe haven into duration exposures, especially dollar assets. But the second half, and this is carrying into the first week of 2023, is a surge into credit buying, you know, mm. especially because these pockets of the market are yielding something when for a very long time they didn't. Do you like credit better than equities because of the risk um, in terms of earnings? I noticed that uh, bottoms up analysts are expecting $230 this year for the S&P 500. Top down analysts are looking at more like 210 or even 200. Yep. There's, there's a big divide there. And I guess, you know, Q4 earnings are about to kick off. So we'll get a taste of what's to come. Yeah, I mean, I love the divide that you just highlighted. It does show why in equities you got to be selective in this environment as opposed to really focusing on that macro top-down equity uh, call, which is why we remain underweight there. Um, but when you think about uh, that credit to equities preference, absolutely, you, you hit the nail on its head in that we do like credit more than equities in a recessionary environment, especially where earnings have so far held up better than than expected so we the pain in earnings has not come yet uh, the season kicks off on friday we do expect q4 growth to to hit uh, zero or less in the u.s europe the mix is a bit different europe has had tailwinds from a weaker euro for the large caps which have boosted numbers more than expected so far um, but the pain is is yet to come in in, in earnings it's all got to be uh, selective on sectors as well so pain is still to come on earnings and one of the areas of the european earnings space that had uh, benefited europe last year was energy of course yeah so that part of, uh, of the european uh, equity um, landscape doing pretty well does that continue despite the fact we've seen certainly gas prices coming off highs mm -hmm. Maybe not to the same extent of 2022, although I do think, you know, for the energy sector, the integrated uh, energy sector in, in Europe, there can still be opportunities, especially given that we haven't seen the full effect on their prof profits uh, in 2022. That's still la carrying forward. One other area in European equities while talking sectors is luxury. Mm. That's starting to come up um, as, you know, you don't typically expect those types of consumer sectors to do well in a recession. But, but luxury, China. yes, China. A tailwind of reopening, uh, foot traffic back to luxury uh, goods and uh, stores in, in Europe is on the rise. So the data is suggesting that this sector is also well positioned. And we eventually might see more Chinese uh, travelers into Europe, which would be another thing to watch. Thank you so much, Karim. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Karim Chedid uh, here in the studio in London from BlackRock. Coming up on the program, the top 50 companies to watch in 2023, as picked out for us by Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll dive into a few of the stories behind their big tech stories today. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, Tony Garza. That's coming up later in programming. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Kaylee Lines is on assignment today. Now from Disney to Porsche, Bloomberg Intelligence has identified 50 companies worth watching this year based on growth prospects, management changes and plans for new products and services. Bloomberg's Joe Easton joins us now to take us through the detail. Um, Joe, before we get into any stock specifics then, what are the broader themes? I mentioned a couple of them. What are the broader themes that have helped companies sort of qualify for this 50 to watch list? Yeah, so I think what we'll see is a kind of repricing of some of the issues that we saw last year. So we're looking at areas like real estate, got a few companies in there, particularly in the UK, and also renewables, which is another strong area in the report from BI. Um, and then the China reopening still plays into the big thing. So there's a few companies on there that stuck out, like Prudential and areas 
of the financial services sector exposed to Asia mm. could see a bit of recovery. So I think it's those beaten down sectors that are sticking out in this report. OK, and what about specific companies? We've got a few of them on that uh, graphic for our radio audience. Well, I won't read them all because there are 50. But <laughs> there are, get, get, take us through a few of the highlights. Yeah, so a couple for me that stood out. Um, Glencore is an interesting one in the UK. Um, this is really because their coal business is doing well, which is kind of something that nobody really expected. Coal was kind of the energy sector that was sort of seen as in the past now. But given gas prices have gone up so much, coal is now seen as a short-term kind of um, stopgap for the sector. So that's an interesting one, bit of a strange one. Novo Nordisk is on there because they're doing very well in the obesity and diabetes sector, which is really strong. There's a lot of excitement around that among analysts. So those are probably two of the stocks yeah. in Europe that I like the most. I love the coal theme, right? Who would have thought that global warming would... Um, be celebrated for thwarting an authoritarian dictator making a war in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, let's talk about some of the U.S. stocks, though. Netflix is one that I think is interesting. Um, as you know, it's such a volatile stock, um, hinging on, I guess, subscriber numbers and um, the kind of margins that they can keep. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, we saw that huge sell-off in subscriber numbers and the stock price around, I think it was around six months ago. And it's now kind of um, stabilised a little bit in terms of the numbers that they report on the quarter. So the next thing will be whether there will be another hit to those subscriber numbers as interest rates continue to, to come up and then ease off. And also as we really see the worst of the economic downturn uh, in the US and around the world. So that'll be key for Netflix. We've obviously had some big hits out recently. I watched the Glass Onion uh, film at the weekend. I was a little bit confused by it, but I thought it was pretty <laughs> enjoyable. So they've still got those key titles that are attracting subscribers to Netflix, I think. I will say I thought Knives Out, the original, was far better. Anna, have you seen both of those films? No, I speak with no authority on this subject, so I'll go no further. All right, well... I have to agree. I have yeah. to agree. The first I'll put it on my list. Yeah, yeah. The first one is better. Definitely, I'd say so. <laughs> OK, well, there, there you have it. That's authoritative. What about the uh, UK real estate sector, Joe? Something that I know we talk about fairly often. How can that feature... Well, does it feature for positive reasons, given a rising rates environment? I think so, and I think that's because of how much the valuations have come down. So the valuations have come down around 35% in, ter in terms of the stock prices. And the value of property in the UK is probably only expected at the worst end to trough at around 20%. So there's already a cheapness in those stocks. And I know that um, Tim Craighead and the BI guys put Shaftesbury on their list. They own the uh, West End theatres around London, so they're probably the biggest investor in that area. And there's definitely some value uh, in those stocks, I mm. think. OK, still an emphasis on, um, on, on getting out and socialising rather than the buying stuff, perhaps, then. Joe, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Joe Easton with the latest on that Big Take story. NI Big Take is the function to use on the Bloomberg terminal to read it in full. Coming up next, President Biden's contentious border visit. More on what it means for his meeting with the Mexican president. That's looming on the agenda. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lines is on assignment. Let's get a look now at what's ahead today. Um, the key market moving events that we're watching out for this week as well. Um, we got U.S. President Joe Biden in Mexico for the North American Leaders Summit um, today. And then tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, Fed Chair Jerome Powell takes part in a panel discussion on central bank independence in Sweden. Thursday, we get U.S. inflation figures. This could be the big one, folks. Plus, was it a Christmas bonanza for U.K. retailers? We'll get updates from Tesco, Marks & Spencers, as well as Apparently it's ASOS, but I feel like it should be ASOS because it's as seen on screen, right? Friday, it's all about Wall Street. A host of banks are reporting earnings, including Bank America, JP Morgan, Citi, and Wells Fargo. Tons of banks coming out with Q4 earnings on Friday. Now let's get more on President Biden's trip to Mexico. He's going to meet with the Mexican president and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau as well. We're joined by Rosalind Matheson Bloomberg, senior executive editor for government. And I know... Roz, the president is um, going to visit the border as well. And this is a huge political topic for the U.S. What do we expect? 
Well, that's right. So this meeting is what what's known as the three amigos between the leaders of Canada, Mexico and the US. And of course, the relationship between those countries is arguably on a better footing since Joe Biden came to office. But there are still real issues here. And one of them, as you note, is, is migration. And the other one, of course, is drugs. And so you're going to see sort of pressure for some sort of tangible progress from the US president with Mexico on this issue. Uh, what he did is he recently announced a program where they will allow some migrants from some countries who apply to come in to the US. But those who just show up at the south border they'll probably not be let in. So he's trying to placate those who are on the border states who say we can't just have people continuing to come across uh, unhindered uh, and allow a pathway for, for some migrants to come in, particularly to add to the workforce in the US. So there seems to be an understanding with Mexico that that's something that they can do. So you can expect some conversation around that. You can expect possibly an announcement that they've agreed in full to do that. But obviously also there's going to be conversations around the drug trade and of course the events in Brazil yesterday will come into this meeting right. either way. Yeah, the, the, of course the problem is that um, a lot of these migrants come in regardless of whether or not they're allowed and um, the allegation is that they bring deadly drugs with them. Uh, that's the Mexico-U.S. part of it. What is Justin Trudeau going to do at this meeting? Well, they've, they've made clear they actually don't want to really talk about energy policy that much. And, of course, that's an issue of contention with the way that uh, the president in Mexico, López Obrador, has been uh, pushing his nationalization, his protection of the energy industry in Mexico. And Justin Trudeau has said, well, we actually don't really need to come at that this time around. We can talk a little bit about sort of, again, migration and drug issues. But this really seems to be more of a get-to-know-you kind of conversation and just setting the floor for some further conversations down the track. It doesn't seem as though Canada is coming with major tangibles out of this. Um, of course, the Mexican president wants funding for a big solar project, which is sort of on the border area with the US. So he might even hit up Canada for some of that. But it seems like the real issues here are between the US and Mexico. Mm. And of course, it's going to be sideswiped by the events in Brazil. Yes, and let's get to those then, Ros, because you mentioned them a couple of times. I mean, how long is our attention going to be on this story? How, how long does it develop for, I suppose? Security services now largely in control of what's going on in Brasilia, but some in the Lula camp calling this a coup attempt. Where does this go next? Well, that's right. And there are still quite a few uh, Bolsonaro supporters in the vicinity, even though they've arrested about 400 and they seem to be in control now of the buildings. Um, but of course, there's a lot to play out here. One of the big questions is what happens to Jair Bolsonaro, who's currently in the States, ostensibly on extended holiday in, in, in Orlando? Does the US need to somehow get him back to Brazil? If so, is he tied up in this? Does he face claims of that? Does he get arrested if he comes in? Uh, and how much can Lula keep all those factions at bay and start to try and enact an agenda. So there's a lot to play out here. And as we saw with the attack on the U.S. Capitol, of course, there's a long tail to these events because beyond the immediacy of what happened, they show just how polarised uh, the country is, a bit like the U.S. Yeah. Is there read across from Capitol Hill, from Washington, to what we saw in Brasilia, Ros? Well, there are similarities and there are differences. Of course, the claim here is that some of the police officials and local officials in Brasilia possibly were complicit in this, and it was planned. It wasn't just sort of an opportunistic moment, let's go and storm some buildings in Brasilia, whereas in D.C. it just seemed like the police force was overwhelmed by the size and scope of it. So that's one key difference and how it then plays out in Brazil as they try and put federal control in the capital as they put some of these officials to one side and say, well, hang on, is there a conspiracy here that you were involved in? So that's one key difference. But the overarching similarity is, again, these are societies and government and, 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 and countries that are severely polarised, and that runs through uh, well after these events themselves have passed, mm. as we've seen with the recent turmoil in D.C. over the Speakership okay. of the House. Ros, thanks so much for joining us. Rosalind Matheson joining us there uh, with the outlook for Brazil and some of the North American geopolitics beyond. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Tom, John and Lisa will be with you. This is Bloomberg.